Well, let's start. It is uh, 2 p.m. on a beautiful Tuesday, April 7 afternoon in Boulder, Colorado. I was looking out the window. We have clear blue sky and a warm day. You are attending a virtual session uh, on, from the Congress on World Affairs. This is the session uh, on uh, the, the economic impacts of COVID. And we have uh, a really outstanding panel for, this, uh, for today's session. I will be the moderator. My name is Martin Boileau. I am a professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Colorado. I am also on the faculty committee of the International Affairs Program. And, uh, and my uh, research interests are in macroeconomics, so I'm particularly interested in what our panelists have to say today. Uh, before we start, uh, we would like to hear from you. There will be uh, a Q&A session uh, during the last, uh, hopefully, third of, uh, of our session today. You can submit questions. For those of you who are joining us on Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature uh, that is at the bottom of, uh, of your screen, just beside the green share button. For those of you joining us on YouTube Live, you can submit question to the YouTube feature, uh, YouTube chat feature, and it will make uh, its way to us as well. Okay, so I will curate those questions and hopefully uh, have an interesting discussion about those later. It would be great because we want to hear from you. It would be great if you could tell us your, your location, where you are, maybe uh, just put uh, the city you're in or if you're in a different country. And uh, you can also uh, let us know your, your, uh, your current, the current use of your time, right? So we would like to hear from students, uh, but from all sorts of, uh, all kinds of people. So let me, uh, let me start first, I would like to uh, thank the organizers of the Conference on World Affairs for putting up an incredible program under, under very difficult circumstances. I want to I want to thank you, audience, for joining us. But I'm, I, I also uh, preemptively will thank our panelists because I, I I think you will you will agree with me that they are really an outstanding group. So let me introduce them to you, and then I will give each of them. Uh, sometimes to, to give a remark before we open up uh, to questions. Our first expert is uh, Rebecca Fannin, who is an expert on global innovation, and she is herself a media entrepreneur. Uh, her writing has appeared in, in many outlets, amongst them the Harvard's, Harvard Business Review, Forbes magazine. Um, she uh, uh, you know, I will introduce Rebecca first because alphabetically she's there first, but also because she is an expert on China and she was uh, likely the first uh, American journalist to, to write about the entrepreneurial boom in China. And she's has uh, provided uh, expert testimony to Congress on China. So it, it seemed fitting to, uh, to present her first. So thank you for joining us, Rebecca. Glad uh, to be here. <laughs> Our uh, second panelist will be uh, John Haveman, who has a PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. Uh, John is an economic expert who is currently the executive director of the National Economic Education Delegation. He's also a principal at Marin Economic Consulting. Um, John is, is used to these kinds of presentation. In particular, uh, he was a senior economist on the President's Council of Economic Advisors. So. Thanks for joining us, John. Uh, uh, our third panelist is Trina Suderos, who's currently the director of the Health Research Institute at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, and in particular, she leads a team that examines the impact of federal health policies on the economy. Um, prior to this appointment, um, Trisha was a, a, a well-respected uh, science and medical reporter at the Chicago Tribune, and she has received a number of national awards for her work as a journalist. Thanks for joining us, Trina. And um, our last panelist is uh, Richard Wobekind, who has uh, a PhD in economics from the University of Colorado. 
He is currently the executive director of the business research division at the Lee School of Business. Uh, Rich is a past president and a fellow and a past president of the National Association for Business Economists. He has also received uh, prestigious career awards from the Association of University Business and Economics Research. Thanks, Richard, for joining us. So the way we will proceed, I will let uh, each uh, speaker, each of our panelists have some time to, to provide remarks, and then we will uh, gather for more sort of uh, panel discussions. We will start with Rebecca. So please, Rebecca, share with us your, your thoughts on this. Well, sure. Um, I can't think of any better way to, to start than to recognize that the founder of Zoom, which we're all on now today, and uh, living our lives on Zoom practically, he's from China. Uh, he's a graduate of the Shandong Science and Technology University and master's in engineering student and came to the US um, about 20 years ago and got involved with WebEx, which was kind of the uh, predecessor to Zoom. It was a video conferencing tool that everybody was in on uh, in those days. And so uh, when WebEx was sold uh, for billions of dollars, um, he uh, earned his first billion. Uh, and he went to work for Cisco, which had acquired uh, WebEx. And then um, he um, got to thinking about, you know, a video application which would be perfect for mobile and uh, would be simpler to use. And that is how Zoom originated. Um, and uh, he has uh, done very well with Zoom. It went public last year uh, in New York and has its stock has gone through the roof uh, with all of us working remotely now and doing conferences remotely. Uh, so congratulations to Eric Yuan from China, uh, one of the tech entrepreneurs that um, I've been covering uh, throughout my career. Um, many trips to China about um, 100 times over the past 20 years, uh, interviewing people like Jack Ma of Alibaba and Robin Lee of Baidu. Uh, but uh, Eric is the, the new generation. Uh, he's the new generation who's hit it big. Um, now, another Chinese tech company that's also uh, really uh, right in the middle of all this is TikTok. Uh, so TikTok represents uh, a company uh, called ByteDance, uh, which originated in China. Um, it's funded by US and China uh, investors. And of course, now it's gone global. I mean, all of us are, well, I'm not really using TikTok, but it seems like everyone else I know is on TikTok. And if you turn on the television, they talk about TikTok. And so TikTok has gone global and millions and millions of users. Another example of how China's tech sector has really gone global and how it's changed over the past uh, two, uh, two decades and two decades and a half. Uh, so, uh, I really saw, saw the entrepreneurial boom from the very beginning in about uh, 1999, 2000. Uh, that's when the Google of China got started. Uh, that's uh, when the Yahoo of China got started. That's when the Google of China got started shortly thereafter. All these uh, copycats of Silicon Valley successes were copied in China in the early, in the first generation. And most of those entrepreneurs in China had gotten their education here in the West, in the US, and gotten their, some career experience here in the West before they went back to China to start their own, their own um, startup. And many of them did very well and in including their venture capital investors. Um, but fast forward a few years and um, uh, it's no longer about copying in China. It's really about innovating and it's innovating not only technologies, but it's innovating business models. Um, and uh, today, I think we're seeing the US and China as two uh, superpowers, uh, tech and economic superpowers who are competing. Uh, and certainly in the tech realm, this was not the case two decades ago. Silicon Valley had the clear lead, but today Silicon Valley does have a challenger in China uh, so if you look at um, most any sector, uh, there are incredible strides by Chinese entrepreneurs. 
uh, looking at uh, Tencent and Tencent's WeChat mobile app. It's very, um, everyone's on it in China. It's used for um, shopping, uh, communicating, calling, uh, texting, uh, buying online, uh, and everyone is on it uh, in China. It's the default communication system. Email is dead. Uh, it's all WeChat. Uh, we don't have anything like that in the U.S., uh, really. Uh, that is a what would be called a super app. And um, we're only now beginning to get to that point where we're seeing multiple applications with one, within one app. And I, probably the closest thing is Uber with um, Uber Rides and Uber Eats. Um, you know, I've seen things, other things in China that in, uh, for instance, the use of robotics and augmented reality and the whole new idea of e-retailing uh, is so much more advanced uh, in China than it is here in the US um, or the rest of the world. Uh, and you see um, augmented reality signs telling you the uh, ingredients of every food, where it came from, how long it took to ship, uh, where it shipped from, uh, and that's all on a screen. Um, there are robots serving in the, ro in the restaurants, in the in-store uh, supermarkets. So my point is that China's tech uh, scene has developed incredibly uh, over the past two decades. And it's now uh, a, a rising power uh, and a challenger to the U.S. for tech leadership. Uh, there's no other market that comes close to it in the world. Uh, if you look at patents, if you look at R&D spending, if you look at venture capital, all of this, China is right behind the U.S. and growing faster than the U.S. is. Um, now, in the beginning, I would say maybe the coronavirus was really a, a halt for China. But now that it's hit the U.S. and China is recovering from it, you know, we're, we're, both, in the, we're both in the same boat. So uh, we're going to have to see how this all impacts um, the startup world and innovation going forward and collaboration between the US and China, which used to be very active, but now is not active because there's been a lot of pushback uh, by the US over China's rise and um, from Washington DC. And we've seen a lot of regulations come in place that really are impacting the progress of China going forward. Uh, so uh, I think I'll just wrap it up there and uh, we can talk more about some of these issues uh, as we go forward. But uh, thank you very much for listening. And um, my Tech Titans of China book um, talks about these new tech titans. And my first book, Silicon Dragon, talked about the first generation of the internet entrepreneurs from China. Um, they're a decade apart and a world apart in terms of China tech. So thanks for listening. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rebecca. John? OK, Martin, uh, thanks very much. And thanks very much to CWA for putting this panel together and inviting me to participate in it. Um, I'm going to spend, I guess, about the next seven minutes uh, providing sort of an overview uh, of my thinking about the coronavirus pandemic and how it's affecting the US economy and economic policy. Uh, in the United States. Um, I'll, I'll start off by, by asking what seems a silly question, but, but some of the answers to it are, are helpful going forward uh, in, in our conversation. Um, and the, the question is, what is this? Um, we all sort of at some level know what this is, but, but in my context, it's a, it's a health crisis um, that has really dramatic macroeconomic consequences. Um, the implications for the US economy are, are tremendous. Started off thinking it wasn't going to be that big a deal. Um, okay, this is a thing that's that's afflicting China. And that's going to hurt our trade with China. It's about two percent of GDP. So you know, our economy might take a quarter, a half a percent uh, hit in terms of GDP. Um, and then we learned that it was starting to pop up in Iran and Italy, um, and that's when the stock markets in the U.S. really started taking notice, uh, as did consumers um, who went to the shelves and bought all the toilet paper. So it went from a supply side shock to a demand side shock, um, and then a financial sector shock. Uh, we had liquidity problems that the Federal Reserve uh, was actually doing a masterful job um, of addressing. 
Uh, so it's, it's a perfect storm, supply, demand, and financial sector. Perfect storm of economic shocks for the US economy. Um, one nice aspect of it is that there's nobody in particular to blame. We can't blame the financial sector. We can't blame home buyers the way that we did 10 years ago. And what that does is it facilitates uh, the formation and, and implementation of economic policy uh, to do battle uh, with what we're facing. Right? So we really have two kinds of policies uh, that are being, being implemented. The first uh, are social policies. Right, all the social distancing, the shelter at home, don't go out, so wash your hands, don't touch your face, um, all of that. Uh, and that has dramatic implications for the economy. We've seen the implications a little bit over the last couple of weeks. Um, initial unemployment claims uh, had the peak, the highest level that they had ever, ever achieved in recorded history was about 700,000 people uh, in a given week. Um, the, the first week in, where we saw some evidence they were upwards of 3 million, about 3.3 million people. And last week they were announced at 6.6 .6 million people. All right, so that's a, a, a tenfold increase uh, in unemployment claims over, over the previous record. Uh, employment last week, it was report, reported that in March, we lost 700,000 jobs. That's sort of on a par with what we experienced during the Great Recession a, a decade ago. Um, but that's only the first week into this. And that was a, a, a dramatic $700,000 uh, job decline after about a $150,000 increase the month before. That also only really covers the first half of March. And it's really uh, the second half of March where we're in the soup. So in early May, when the numbers for April come out, I expect much, much more significant job declines then. All right, so that all then begs the question of economic policy. Right? So social policy is shutting down the economy. So what economic policies do we have to deal with it? Well, there's sort of four stages of economic policies in something like this. Um, the first stage is health. Right? And we spent about $8 billion trying to buoy the healthcare system to deal with it. Um, that's proved to be not nearly sufficient, but that was the first phase. The second phase was, was social. Um, social support and try to try to make it so that a lot of people who don't have paid sick leave can stay home if they're sick. About 40% of those in the bottom quarter, quarter of the wage distribution don't have a paid sick leave policy. So they're going to go to work if they don't, if they, if they're sick, but we don't want that from a social perspective. So that was sort of phase two, uh, increased unemployment insurance, try and, try and help those um, who are, are suffering financially. Uh, the third, the third phase was the 2.2 trillion dollars passed uh, last week or the week before last. Um, that was really broad-based, trying to provide a lot of support, small businesses, large businesses, uh, to families with with direct payments. Um, and an awful lot of that was meant to support people uh, who aren't going to be able to work, which is an enormous part of the of the workforce, um, as well as to support business continuity. Right, really key to coming back when we do, I don't know when, but when we do and we will, we'll flip that switch back on. And when we flip, flip that switch back on, it would be great if all of the lights responded and right? if all the businesses were still in place and they could just pick up where they left off. That's probably not going to happen, but th that's what a lot of those policies were directed towards. And we're looking at a fourth phase. We hear talk of uh, transportation infrastructure. To build $2 trillion coming out of DC. I don't think we're nearly ready for that. We don't need economic stimulus until we start telling people it's time to go outside and go to restaurants again, right? If we're telling people to stay at home and not spend, we shouldn't be trying to stimulate the economy. We should be spending more to support families. That time will come um, and the nature of the stimulus should really depend on the nature of the resistance to the economy coming back. We can talk more about that in the Q&A if you'd like. Then there's monetary policy. Um, two roles for monetary policy. One is to stabilize the economy, uh, which the Fed did very rapidly, dropping the federal funds rate from about one and a, quarter, one and a half down to effectively zero. Uh, and, and then liquidity. The Federal Reserve uh, has injected an enormous amount of liquidity, um, partly through quantitative easing, as we saw a, a decade ago, um, and partly through just voicing support for a lot of institutions that help uh, provide liquidity uh, to the economy and keep the wheels that are still turning, um, turning. 
right? So both the Fed and Congress acted very quickly and accomplished in about 18 days what it took about 18 months to accomplish during uh, the Great Recession. Uh, so, you know, hats off uh, to both Congress and the Federal Reserve for acting fast. Um, we, could, we could quibble uh, in Q&A if you want to with some of the federal policies that were implemented. Um, and we can talk more about what industries were vulnerable and what workers are vulnerable. Um, a couple of uh, massively unanswered questions um, here are, you know, how, how long is this going to last? How long are we going to be sheltered in place? And then there's the question of how big is the economic hit going to be? I've seen forecasts for Q2 of 2020 uh, being down by 50 percent relative to what we might otherwise have expected. So that's fairly dramatic. Um, and then what is, what's, what's going to change in terms of the structure of the economy? Right? This is a grand experiment. Nobody impose it, but it's being imposed and we're going to learn a lot about it. Businesses are going to learn about telecommuting. That occupation works with telecommuting, that occupation doesn't. So I think we'll see a lot more telecommuting, we'll see a lot more telehealth. Um, and then I'll leave you with, with my, my touchy-feely hope, and that is that uh, as I ride my bicycle around, I see everybody taking a walk, a walk around the block. And I hope that at the end of the day, people are going to rediscover the walk around the block and rediscover their neighbors. So maybe there are some silver linings to what we're going through. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. Um, our third panelist is uh, Trina Suderos. Trina. Thanks. Um, so what I'm going to talk about um, is sort of bring it down to the level of, of healthcare. Um, we've been looking at PwC at the healthcare industry and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the healthcare industry. And I think it's one kind of um, uh, unappreciated uh, situation where um, the healthcare providers, in particular the hospitals, um, have been impacted greatly financially, as well as trying to take care of, you know, sort of the human toll of the pandemic. So one thing we've seen is that, you know, hospitals have had to um, have seen their expenses explode um, in all of this. Obviously, they're buying more PPE. They are hiring um, staff. They are um, having to retrofit facilities to become ICUs uh, where they were no ICUs. They're setting up temporary drive-through lab testing. Uh, they, are, they are spending wildly. You, you hear about ventilator prices going through the roof. So the expenses we see going, you know, um, obviously up uh, greatly. But um, the other side of that is that uh, revenues have dried up. So most hospitals have canceled all non-essential procedures. They have canceled office visits. They are trying to stand up some kind of telehealth, but nobody knows how much they're going to be reimbursed for those visits. Um, so you see sort of this flattening out or drying up dramatically overnight, sort of falling off a cliff um, revenues. At the same time, most hospitals do not have a lot of days cash on hand. We took a look at HRI, um, my team took a look at days cash on hand average for hospitals um, before the pandemic hit. And it turns out most hospitals, if you look, they have about two months cash on, days cash on hand, about three and a half to four months if you include um, accounts receivable, so money they're expecting to collect from um, patients. And, and that's not a whole lot when your revenues fall off a cliff. It might be fine in normal times, but when you have to cancel all of your elective procedures and you uh, shut down all of your offices, you know, things really change. And so a lot of hospitals are facing a liquidity crisis that is hitting just at the time that their expenses are exploding and they have this massive task of, of, you know, caring for the, the surge of patients with COVID-19. So you can imagine, you know, so the stress is on the hospital. So the, this is happening all across the country. We took a look at Detroit, Miami, New York City, Chicago, New Orleans hospitals in these um, places, you know, places that are having sort of, um, you know, sort of turning into the epicenters or the new epicenters of the pandemic in the U.S. And those hospitals in some of those places, the hospitals have just a few weeks of days of cash on hand. So 
there's a severe liquidity crisis for hospitals that's going on sort of underneath the surface of all of the other challenges that they're facing. So I think that's one of the economic um, impacts of the pandemic that's really been somewhat underappreciated. It's unclear what the CARES Act that was just passed um, you know, last week will do for them. There's about $100 billion in there. Um, to help hospitals out, but there it hasn't been, um, you know, very um, it hasn't been decided yet how that money is going to be doled out. So um, hospitals are doing all kinds of things right now to sort of free up cash that they need um, to to uh, meet payroll. Even uh, one of the things you see that I've never seen before um, is furloughs in hospitals, layoffs, uh, pay cuts, um, executives taking pay cuts. Um, you see all these things, you see hospitals that are threatening to, um, well, not threatening, but saying that they might have to close their doors before the surge of patients come in. So I think this is sort of an interesting and um, an alarming uh, pattern that we're seeing uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis. And we're, we're working with lots of um, providers to help them kind of free up that cash and figure out how they're going to, you know, meet their, um, you know, their uh, obligations in the next couple of weeks. And then, you know, in the midterm and then in the post COVID-19 uh, period. Beyond that, we see um, kind of an unprecedented thing of um, job losses in the healthcare sector. Um, before the COVID-19 period, we've had, we had, I think 374,000 jobs added in the last 12 months. In that jobs report that I think John was referencing, there was a loss of something like I think it was 42,500 jobs, and that you know you just never see. It. Healthcare industry has just grown and grown and grown, um, but we see that um, that jobs are being shed, and mostly they're in uh, ambulatory um, services like dentist offices that had to close and they lay off their staff. You see it in um, home health. Uh, and they, they have had to, to lay off staff. And um, I think interestingly, you see it and I've written it down somewhere, um, medical and diagnostic labs actually lost uh, jobs um, where we see this enormous demand for um, testing, but actually they lost jobs in the last, uh, in March. Um, so I, Martin's giving me the, the uh, warning, so I will stop it there. I could talk forever about it, but I won't. I will just um, pass the baton. <laughs> Thank you so much, Trina. Um, fascinating. Uh, Richard, you, you have the, the, you know, the last, our last panelist right now. Yes, and unfortunately, um, I was going to say some of the things that John said, but much more articulately than I can, but I think it would be useful at least to sort of reiterate just a couple of these things as we go forward. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, to the audience, uh, we have two economists and we agree on a, a, a huge percentage of uh, the, the policy pieces that were uh, discussed. And hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about them in more detail. Uh, as, as John uh, mentioned to you, you know, it's a, it's a medical sort of emergency on top of an economy. Lots of people have comp been comparing this to sort of Hurricane Katrina, except for the entire country, that many things are shut down. But unlike a hurricane, the physical infrastructure is still in place. Uh, what we have to make sure to maintain, which he highlighted in his comments, is the business and government infrastructure. So when the road to recovery begins, we can maximize that road to recovery. Uh, the national economy was on a pretty strong footing prior to COVID-19. Well, we were running roughly at potential GDP, even though people wanted us to have a higher level. We were running at basically at potential GDP. And unemployment rates, U6, the lowest ever since it's been recorded, and U3, the sort of headline unemployment rate, lowest in 40 years, 3.5%. So you take an economy that's in incredibly great shape, and all of a sudden you have this incredibly dramatic event, which takes it, knocks it totally off kilter. Uh, we don't know a lot, economic data lags. So we only have a few data points, uh, as you heard, uh, but we know the impacts have been really large. Uh, similar to the numbers that uh, John mentioned for uh, the nation going to 3 million and to 6 million over the last couple of weeks, in Colorado, we had previously had a 7,000 was our high back in the recessionary period of 08, 09. Uh, 
we've been running at two, 2K a week. We went to 14K and then last week we went to 60,000 uh, unemployed filings, initial unemployment filings. So similar types of impacts here on the local economy. And as mentioned, minus 700,000 in, in the March jobs report. So the national unemployment rate, again, being at its lowest uh, unemployment rate in 40 years, three and a half percent, jumps to 4.4 percent, and it's going to be in double digits within a month or two. So you're you're talking about a dramatic event that's going to be have much higher sort of front page news data and numbers than we saw in the Great Recession. Picking a scenario, uh, I, I I don't know that we want to you know put too much in this, but you heard minus 50% for the second quarter. Uh, there are uh, lots of forecasts out there. All of them show a steep plunge in the second quarter. We've been talking about the 25% range. Uh, third quarter negative, but less so. And then finally, Q4 moves back into positive territory. That's of course, if we get uh, ahead of the pandemic, if, if we actually get some control over it. And that's as good, your guess is as good as mine on that. We've seen uh, industries taking the initial brunt. Clearly, a leisure and hospitality is, is the big one. Uh, a huge percentage of that minus 700,000 was in the leisure and hospitality area. Uh, retail, of course, is following along. And as you just heard, uh, health is also health healthcare. And of course, that is very unusual as, as the, uh, Trina uh, told you. Construction also uh, at taking a pretty good hit in terms of the social distancing. Uh, as was alluded to, uh, a, a, a lot of these workers in leisure and hospitality and retail, and even some of, of these people in construction are at the low end of the wage scale. They're certainly the most vulnerable when we talk about these things. So when we uh, discuss uh, policies and um, have more of this in the Q&A, clearly uh, we're, we're trying to support people who are not, people who've got months and months of rent in their bank account. We're talking about a lot of people who are basically have been living month to month and don't have very much in the way of savings. So I think the federal policies that were discussed will help a lot and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about them in more detail shortly. Certainly the CARES Act, with the paycheck provision, trying to keep people, uh, companies keeping their people employed, the unemployment payments, and certainly the small business loans, unprecedented that uh, coordination between fiscal and monetary policy, lending the Fed 450 billion to back $4.5 trillion in loans uh, at a credit lending facility. Um, so I couldn't agree more. The Fed in, uh, moved fast, the federal government moved fast, and it's been a good thing for our economy. So uh, similar to what I was saying about the national economy, I want to say the same thing about Colorado. We were in tremendous footing pre-crisis, two and a half percent unemployment, lowest recorded in history, certainly a top 10 economy nationally. Uh, but going into this, We've seen uh, leisure and hospitality, as I mentioned, decimated. And there's a very strong overweight in the Colorado economy for the tourism industry. So that's gonna be particularly difficult on Colorado and particularly difficult on certain parts of Colorado, which don't have diversified economies. In addition, oil, uh, the oil price plunge, which I'm not attributing entirely to coronavirus by any means, has impact on the energy dependent uh, parts of the state. And frankly, underlying all of this beyond the healthcare uh, discussion you just uh, heard, state and local government finances are gonna be really uh, tight uh, going along. So what can I say that's a little bit more positive? Uh, on the more positive note, we do have a large number of uh, businesses and companies that we are set up to do work at home. We do have the high tech and the cloud. Uh, so we are sort of doing that and we are adapting to that. And as was raised by at least one or two of the uh, prior speakers, I'm really interested in, in thinking about what the economy is gonna look like after this all ends. So I will say thank you for your time and turn it back to Mark Dinn. 
Wow, thank you, thank you all for these, uh, for these great uh, discussions. Um, now I'm gonna try to uh, set up uh, more of a sort of panel discussion. So please uh, panelists join in. Um, so I wanna highlight the first thing that I, I think that both uh, uh, Richard and John have discussed is that it's, it's actually uh, surprising to me that most economists are in agreement about, about what to do. I was reading a number of uh, papers um, and basically the, the, the wisdom from most economists is simply let the epidemiologists and the healthcare workers do their job. So in that, so if we need to start somewhere then let's think about the health policy side of this to start. The, you know, for our panel. So, um, so we've heard a lot about flattening the curve. Um, that's one potential response to this, but another potential response is to also increase capacity. And I'm sort of worried from Trina's discussion that increasing capacity might not be might not be simple. So. What is feasible? What can we expect from the healthcare sector to help us expand capacity and deal with the immediate crisis? Yeah, I can take that, Martin. Um, so I think I think one thing that's kind of come out of this that that has been um, that's been shown to be the Achilles heel of our nation's response is the supply chain. That every step of the way, um, we have found supply chain issues that have been sort of the rate determining step for the rest of it. So you have tests rolled out, but then you are missing swabs. You have swabs, but you're missing a reagent. You have, you have the reagent now, but you're missing another part of the test kit. You have PPE, then you don't have the, you know, some other part of the PPE. You have, um, you have ventilators, you've got a room for the ventilators, you've got a bed, but you are missing a respiratory therapist. So there's these, everything has sort of this um, constellation of needs in order for it all to work. And we're finding that if there, the supply chain uh, is broken for any of those, you can't do the rest. And so I think for increasing capacity, for hospitals, it's been an extremely complex question where you have um, you have to think about the workforce, you have to think about the PPE, you have to think about the volume, you have to think about the actual space, you have to think about who's going to clean it, you have to have the disinfectants. The HHS uh, Office of the Inspector General had a report on Monday that outlined sort of um, survey results from uh, hospital executives, and they had asked them about. Um, I think they surveyed them. March 23rd to the 27th, so really recently. And one of the things that popped out to me that I had not heard, and I, I'm on a water cooler call for the firm every morning at 9 a.m. Central, and we hear all kinds of things you know, from, from what we're hearing on the ground. And I had not heard this, but I saw this in the IG report that they, there's questions about um, disinfectants and and like the IV poles and the most basic items that you need to run a room. So I think just to answer your question, increasing capacity is an incredibly complicated thing. And if those supply chains, those many, hundreds of supply chains that are necessary to take care of a single patient, if any of them are, um, you know, wobbly or fractured, you have a hard time uh, doing what you see all these hospitals kind of heroically managing to do. Uh, Martin, if, yes. if I may. Yeah. Um, so, so this that that's that's really the importance of flattening the curve, really aggressively flattening the curve. So, we, if we don't flatten the curve, we're going to be miles above our healthcare capacity. Um, flattening the curve may not get us below, um, but it's gonna it's gonna buy us some time um, that we desperately need um, because of one of the primary failings of our healthcare system. Right. The primary failing of our healthcare system is that it is a for-profit system. Right? It's not a for-health system. It's not a system where we keep supply chains and make sure that all these supply chains are robust to a catastrophe. Right? Everybody is trying to maximize their margins, and that means you reduce the number of hospital beds you have. That means re you reduce supplies to the extent that you think that you can get away with it. Um, and I think that that is an enormous impediment to really responding effectively uh, to what's going on. 
And, and let me add a China angle here too, that um, I think uh, we need to recognize uh, China in, and their uh, outreach to the US in helping us fight the coronavirus. Uh, Alibaba, uh, Jack Ma and Joe Tsai, the uh, two co-founders uh, are among the co-founders of Alibaba uh, have donated uh, ventilators and supplies to the US um, and uh, I think they deserve, uh, you know, credit for doing that. Um, and uh, another aspect of China uh, tech in this whole healthcare situation is that I'm seeing a lot of new investment going into Chinese biotech and biopharma companies uh, to develop drugs, um, new drugs to fight uh, infectious diseases and $700 million of new investment going into this sector in China in the first quarter. Um, and I think we're gonna to continue to see that kind of activity take place. Um, also, um, uh, I've seen some US and China collaboration on testing kits and development of vaccines. So these, these are very positive um, uh, points, I think. Uh, so just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just add, I, I don't know, can I break in just real quick? Yes. Um, I think John raises raised a point about the healthcare system that um, made me think about one of the trends that we've had over, over the years that we've all, I think people have seen as a good trend. So, you know, the inpatient beds have gone down overall in healthcare. And at the same time, outpatient has gone up. So, you know, people are spending fewer days in the hospital. The length of stay is shorter. And that's seen as a good thing to avoid, you know, infections and get people back home quicker. And and outpatient um, surgeries have become very common in procedures. But in this case, the fact that we have shrunken the beds, and you've seen those charts where they compare bed, you know, inpatient beds to 100,000 people ac across different nations, and we're like in the middle. Well. That's that's not good for a pandemic, right? Because you don't have the staffing to staff all that inpatient, but Previously, you know, it was seen as a good thing for, for patients in general. So I just put that out there. Yeah. Wow. Um, I have so uh, another sort of big uh, uh, response uh, uh, that we've needed is, is uh, sort of the, the macroeconomic response that uh, both John and Richard alluded to. But when I read the press, there seemed to be a confusion, at least. Uh, uh, perhaps not amongst economists, but at least in the general public, as to the difference between our social insurance policy, which is you know some what we have we have now, and our and our sort of stabiliz stabilization or our, our ways to to stimulate the economy. So uh, so the two broad question here, and I you know are we um, uh, so you know for, for for our panelists are are we happy with the efforts that have been made so far and at least clarification between those two uh, 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 aspects of the policy and and um, do you know do we so are we happy also not only about, about the right the amount of money but also about the timing that these policies will will take so Don wants to lead with that <laughs> sure, sure. I'll, 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 I'll take it. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm very happy with the, the policies that were put out um, because what I expected was so much worse um, or going to be you know, going to come about so much more slowly. Um, if you if you get in, down into the nuts and bolts of it, I've got I've got a fair number number of quibbles. Um, you know, the, the payments, the $1,200 to individuals and 500 for kids, uh, you know, a lot of those payments are going to go to folks who still have their jobs. Um, now, granted, um, they are making less than $100,000 a year, um, so they can probably use it if they live, especially in San Francisco. Um, but that's not the most efficient use of the money. Um, the increase in unemployment insurance, I think, is a really good idea. Um, but maybe a better idea, and, and I, I think it's Denmark that's doing something like this. You take that money and you give it to small businesses and you provide that unemployment insurance through the small business to their employees. So that, that maintains the relationship 
between the employee and the employer. So that as I alluded to, when they flip the switch back on, they just go right back to work. Um, in addition, and, I, that's, that's, and then with regard to that point, I think the amount of money that's going to small businesses is, is probably too small um, by half, at least. Um, and it, we're going we're gonna to experience a, a, a huge number of small business delinquencies uh, at the end of this. Um, you know, whether or not they've maintained relationships with their, their employees, we're going to have a huge number of small business relationships, uh, bankruptcies, and a lot of those will spiral up to larger businesses, uh, causing problems up the, the, the food chain, if you will. Um, so, you know, I, I applaud what's been done, um, but I think that a little bit more time could have, well, a little bit more effort could have been put into uh, how to do it more thoughtfully. Well, what about the, um, you know, the difference between sort of the current sort of social insurance policy versus sort of the more stimulative aspects of policies that will have to happen at some point? Yeah, yeah, we shouldn't be thinking about stimulus right now. We should be thinking about, you know, okay, what's, what might that look like down the road? Um, and down the road, it's going to be a matter of, okay, what's, what's the problem in terms of getting the economy going? Is it that we've severed all of these employee-employer relationships and we need to spend money to put those back together? Is it because supply chains have become completely disrupted? Is it a, a supply issue, a demand issue, or a liquidity issue? You know, we're going to have to evaluate what's causing the economy to, to come back together slowly and then target those areas for the money. You know, transportation infrastructure, I think, is great, right? We, we, we routinely get a grade of C minus or D on our transportation infrastructure. So I support spending $2 trillion on that. But that might not be the right stimulus here. So uh, I'm reading some of the questions as they come along. Um, uh, it seems that some of our, 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 our uh, uh, audience are, are worried about uh, whether or not we can afford those policies. Well, we were in bad fiscal shape before this started, right? We were already running a, over a trillion dollar deficit. Um, this, this brings the fiscal day of reckoning forward at least a decade, I think. Um, so maybe we will, you know, we'll figure out ways to address that at the end, at the end of this. But at one level, you know, I, I'm kind of a deficit uh, fanatic but we can't afford not to do this right now, unfortunately. I mean, it just has to be done. Uh, and uh, as John was highlighting, a lot of the policies you could quibble with a little bit. Um, you're stimulating demand even with the tax rebates uh, to people who are continuing to work and they're not gonna be able to buy anything more than they're able to buy right now. The, the problems, uh, you know, the restaurants are closed, the retail is closed. So I don't know exactly, you know, what the purpose of, of that piece was. Um, so you could have th thought about ways, I think, to make it a, a little bit more efficient. Flip side, I think the unemployment insurance, the additional check, I, as I mentioned, this is a vulnerable population. So the supplemental checks from the federal government, extremely important uh, in this case. Yeah, that, I'm going to just follow up a little bit. I agree with Richard on, on all of that. Um, but but Rainer, earlier, you alluded to the, the remarkable unanimity of economists on this. Um, and, and this would have been a point where you would expect to see a lot of division within the profession. But, but you know, there's a little bit. There always will be. Um, but even the most ardent of deficit hawks are saying, look, you know, can, can we afford not to do this? Yes. Right? You know, the alternative to spending this money is, is, is unthinkable. Um, so we have to do it. We've got near unanimity. Um, but as, as Richard said, yeah, our, our debt is now, well, before this was 80% of GDP. It's forecast to go up to 180% of GDP by 2050. We may hit that in 2040 now. Um, so we, we've got a bigger issue to deal with, but we're rich enough. We can deal with it when this is all over. Well, from Silicon Valley, uh, the big worry here is the tech startups are struggling to survive now. Um, and it's all about keeping the so-called burn rate down. Uh, that means you're operating cash, you're keeping your expenses down to be able to survive this downturn. Uh, so I think we're going to see a lot of disruption uh, happening in the tech world uh, in Silicon Valley for sure and other hotspots uh, in the U.S. and around the world, uh, because this is not just a U.S. issue, it's a global issue. And um, 
you know, from the venture capital side, uh, that there could be an upside for them um, after they get finished helping their portfolio companies try to tough out uh, this current um, issue. Uh, but after that, it's a good time to invest in new startups um, because a lot of times in these downturns, you see positive things happening uh, like us here on Zoom on webinars and new innovations coming. So there'll be more innovations coming uh, there'll be uh, what they call lower valuations uh, to invest in startups um, because we're in a down cycle. So from the venture capital side, we'll probably see an outpouring of venture capital into new innovations going forward. It's not going to be immediate, but um, I, I would look for that um, in toward uh, the end of this year and into next year as well. And I think we're already starting to see the beginning of that as, as we're starting to flatten the curve. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we're hearing the same thing from the entrepreneurial community here, the, reiterating your point. Um, yeah. c companies with good ideas and just getting off the ground and all of a sudden they're really being hit very, very hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Telehealth is a good, uh, good exception to that. Telehealth <laughs> is a uh, yes. zoom of, uh, of the healthcare world. They're doing pretty good. <laughs> So let's be let's be um, let's be a little bit more optimistic, uh, and and um, let's think a little bit about about uh, about the, the the future and hope things uh, things uh, things will improve. So, um, what will it take? What will it take? So Rebecca alluded earlier that China seemed to be rebounding a little bit, but what would it take for the American economy? to uh, right, for us to, to start getting out, right? To start to restart this thing. So I'm thinking here in terms of what are our abilities to find a good antiviral. So, you know, and if we're very lucky, maybe a vaccine, right? Are we, are we doing what we should be doing in that direction? So let's start with that. Trina, you're, you're, you have the screen, so go. Sure. sure. Um, well, I think, I think I'm, in terms of, you know, getting out of this via a therapeutic, I think, it's going to come in a couple different pieces. There's the antiviral question. You know, what, what can we do? Kind of like um, Tamiflu, where it, you take, do will we find a therapeutic that you can take within the first couple of days of falling sick, and it will minimize your illness and maybe prevent some from getting very sick and and going to the hospital. Then there's the question of the um, immune response that is causing a lot of trouble, and that's where a lot of folks seem to be falling extremely ill. And, and ending up in the ICUs. And so will we figure out a way to treat that um, cytokine release syndrome, which is what mm -hmm. it seems to be. And, um, and we have a lot of therapeutics designed for that already. So, and then we have the vaccine, you know, the question of the vaccine, which is 12 to you know, 18 months if we're lucky. Um, you know, and, and we, we've heard the Bill Gates Foundation is setting up, you know, factories kind of waiting just to, to produce whatever comes out ahead. So that might accelerate a little bit, but it still takes a long time to make a vaccine. I think the, the, the question of, of how is this all gonna, if I had to guess um, and, and spe completely speculate, I think that physicians will figure out how to treat the, the sickest in a more um, effective way using existing treatments and that we will see the death rate come down. We will see the length of stay in hospitals come down and that the curve will flatten a bit because of that. And that that will be um, somewhat of a path out. If it's less of a fatal disease, it will be less of a disease that we all have to hide inside and um, you know, because it will not be a death sentence for you know, your elderly neighbor necessarily. Um, the antiviral, you know, is a big, there's lots of um, uh, candidates out there, you know, there's a lot of, uh, we were just actually, and my, my team was looking at this today, um, and we should be getting some data, you know, in the next couple of weeks, actually, from some of the trials, so it would be interesting to see, you know, so remdesivir is one of them that um, everyone has, you know, sort of um, think, thinks is somewhat promising, and so, but who knows, um, so we'll see on that, uh, but there's lots of other candidates as well, but that that antiviral is really meant for that first period to sort of minimize the that part of that part of the illness. A lot of the severity appears to be a maladaptive immune response 
on the, you know, after seven days. And so that has to be treated differently. Um, it doesn't help to really give an antiviral once your virus is on the way out um, and your, your immune system is, is going haywire, although that's not a scientific term, but. Yeah. <laughs> but what about, what about our, our, current, our current efforts in funding such research, um, funding research that may help uh, find new vaccines or new antiviral drugs or new or new treatments. Are we are we doing enough? Well, you know uh, the the question we should have been asking that question back with the SARS um, original SARS uh, outbreak uh, when there was a lot of interest in coronaviruses and vaccines for coronaviruses. And that all died out because SARS kind of died out. And so I think at this point, it's too, you know, we all would agree it's too little, too late, but even, but we will do a lot. <laughs> I think. So I, I think the whole world's medical community is focused on this. If you have anything to do with viruses, you're thinking about coronaviruses right now. So, um, so that, that's what I would say about that. Yeah, this, this goes back a little bit to the issue of government policy. Um, and one of the smaller categories in all of the spending that the government is doing is healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and and my, my perspective on it is that we, we should be focusing more on healthcare. We should be spending more on healthcare and, and raising capacity. Um, with respect to coming out of this, I, knowing what, what uh, health markers uh, and stuff we need to see is way above my pay grade. Um, but I do worry a lot that given the enormous tension between the economy and health, um, that we will you know, decide that it's time to pull out of this uh, too soon. Um, at which point, you know, maybe the virus goes away for a little bit and then it comes back. Um, I think that looking, looking at China and their experience, we're going to learn a lot about the potential for coming out too soon. Uh, but it's something that I worry about a lot. Yes, Rebecca, could you, could you say a few words about what China is currently doing? Well, they are going back to work and um, they are coming out of it. Um, uh, definitely uh, China was first into it. And so maybe they're first out of it as well. Um, now, whether it's too early or not, um, I mean, we'll see. Uh, there have been some pickup again in, uh, in the numbers. Uh, but, uh, yeah, China was closed down basically for uh, two, uh, two months. And uh, it definitely has um, taken a toll on the Chinese economy and, uh, and has really disrupted things with, uh, for instance, online learning. Uh, every Chinese student is now on to online er learning and all the education uh, tech companies are benefiting. There are a number of, the, a number of them that are publicly traded uh, here in, in New York and uh, they are, uh, their revenues are just increasing incredibly. Uh, so, uh, but I, you know, I hear from a lot of friends in China. Um, they've gone back. They went back to China um, when things started to get really bad here in the U.S. And they went back. They faced the two-week quarantine. And uh, now they're back to work. Um, I, I think it's been really interesting to watch this trend go from China to the U.S. and now U.S. to China. These people, the, the flows of people, a, a number of people I know just said, we've had it with New York, for instance, we're getting out of here and we're going back to Taiwan or we're going back to China. It's much safer there. So, I mean, we'll see. We'll, we'll see about those numbers, how it all adds up in the end. Um, but we're, uh, yeah, it's definitely something to watch. Another country that seemed to have done fairly well and, and seems to be rebounding is South Korea. And yeah. I, was, I was a little bit... Um, you know, well, first, I'm not too sure I understand why they were able to, to manage so well. And I wonder how much of the testing and tracing, uh, can, you know, that perhaps they've implemented in a, in a, in a, in a more timely fashion than, than we have. Yeah, so, well, yeah, a smaller country and they're very tech savvy in, in South Korea. It, it's, uh, it's one of the most mobile nations in the world. I, I think it is. And uh, mobile internet penetration is, is, is just 100% uh, and they're just ahead in a lot of technologies in South Korea in getting it into the hands of the average person uh, is just used to being in this world of high tech. 
uh, in South, and so I think that that benefited them and that, you know, people um, uh, took it seriously. They got the test, they got the test out, people did the test, people paid attention to the stay at home, uh, the quarantines, which has been an issue in the U.S. where people really, you know, some of, some people are paying attention to it and others are not. Um, and I think that comes down to different cultures as well. That's interesting you, you're mentioning this because um, when you think about the development and the implementation of, of good, I, I was going to say good economic policies, but you know, uh, and I understand it to be good policies, period, is that you need, you need to me, you need two things, right? You need, you need a lot of transparency. So you need, right, you need to get the, the right information and you need it, right? You need it quick, you need it to be reliable. Right. And you also need your public leaders to be to be forthright, right? To be right to to, to tell the truth, to tell it like it is. Right. And you need your population to 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 be to be altruistic, right? To be you know to right civic minded. Right. And uh, so I'm wondering if that's you know how much of that as as played. Like for example, my impression is that it's still it would still be uh, I would still be hard pressed to to, to believe the numbers that are coming out of China in terms of the effect that, you know, coronavirus is at. And I think that has perhaps slowed down. Now, maybe not the response to the US, we could easily see the, what was happening in Italy and Spain at that point, so we could have, we could have reacted uh, more rapidly. But also there's this other aspect of, right, of altruism, of, of civic duty, uh, oh, yeah. which, which is, I, was, I was really disheartened seeing all these spring breakers on beaches yeah. while people are dying in New York City. It just, I, I just it broke my heart. So how do we, so is that, so at least, for, you know, at least I know it's not an economics question, but at least for the panel, how much, of, how much role these things have, have played so far in the development of the crisis? That is the transparency, the gathering the right information, and the and the and the civic duty uh, altruistic uh, nature of, of populations. Well, you know, in China, your your neighbor your uh, neighbors were watching out. If you went out uh, and you violated that two week quarantine, uh, uh, you're going to get told on. And in some cases, uh, there were even uh, blocks on the doors. Cannot mm -hmm. come out. Um, and it was a community thing. Like uh, we're all in this together. Let's let's uh, let's work together to um, to prevent this spread, and you do see more of that societal kind of civic mindedness, uh, and there certainly is much more of an independent thread here in the U.S. Of okay, I'm it's not going to be me. I'm not going to get this, so I'm not wearing a mask, and I'm not going to do this, and and I'm I'm not going to continue to go to the beach or whatever. So uh, there are these different aspects that have played out and it's been um, really interesting to watch. Yeah, I think we've, we've, we've suffered from a, a couple of different regards. One is that we, we as a people don't like to be told what to do. Right. <laughs> um, we, we don't like government intrusion in our lives. Right. Um, and we have a government that you know, hasn't been entirely forthcoming. Uh, we have a government that hasn't implemented a lot of, you know, reasonably simple safeguards that other countries have. I have a friend who um, was in Thailand uh, not long ago and she came back. She had to go through a couple of Asian airports before getting to the U.S. And at each of the Asian airports, they took her temperature. Right, coming into the U.S., nothing. It's wow. amazing, yeah. There are an enormous number of seemingly simple things that we could do. They cost money, sure, but they're pretty simple and we could do them that we just aren't doing. Well, in China to get in for years, I mean, you, you pass by this fever check, right? You pass by when you come in. It's an automatic thing. They've had it for years. Yeah. I think the other thing that was, that was a, a big factor for the U.S. is that we we're so slow to get the testing out of the gate. And so because of that, we were unable to contain the, the um, infections to where they, we couldn't tell where they were. And then once we kind of knew because it was, you couldn't ignore it anymore, which was Seattle, then we were not able to easily test enough people around to sort of isolate folks and tamp it all down, which is at least you could see in China Hubei, Hubei province and Wuhan, 
you know, they did contain it and it did not become this conflagration that kind of took over the whole country. But if you look at the US, we, because we didn't have the testing, we still don't have the testing, um, you know, we can't do that. And so that those containment measures were just never available to the US, not yet. Um, I think there's been a lot of, I think uh, Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner has been out last couple of weeks with a plan um, that really involves trying to set up a containment surveillance uh, testing system for the country state by state that would help kind of put that in place once the curve flattens out and we all you know, have some time to, to kind of reset before maybe it comes back in the fall, like John was saying, you know, and I think Richard was saying, you know, that that's the worry. Um, but right now for the first wave, we, we really did not have that. I think the testing was like the real, um, the real downfall for- Yeah, and without the testing, all of us are, are in basically quarantined or, uh, you know, in, uh, in shelter, right? Uh, because sheltered at home, uh, yeah. because uh, we don't know who has and who doesn't. Um, and so that's where I think you know South Korea and Singapore uh, were more advanced in how they handled it, and that they knew that they got the test out, out, and everyone got tested. So you know who has it, and you know then you don't have to quarantine everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we there's some lessons learned to be learned mm -hmm. from yeah, all so, this. So actually, Trina, the, one, one of the questions that I have never heard a, a good, uh, an answer to um, is why we didn't accept the WHO's offer of tests. Have you have you heard anything in that regard? Yeah. yeah the only good answer I've heard is arrogance and hubris. <laughs> I don't know if it's that simple, but the Washington Post did a big story on the sort of what the um, the you know sort of the TikTok on all that and how yeah. that all happened. Um, but I don't know if it's arrogance and hubris uh, entire. Uh, that that's probably. Not fair, but I, I do think it was a huge, it's a huge issue. Even today, I think that that IG report I was referencing earlier, hospitals are reporting seven day turnarounds for tests. Yeah. And that is a huge problem, not only for, not only for the, like who has it end of things before you get to the hospital, but if you want to discharge someone to a rehab facility and free up that bed for the next COVID patient, and you have to wait seven days and that rehab facility won't take that patient until they have a negative test. That person's gonna sit there and take up that bed for seven days and possibly get sick again because they're in the hospital and they're surrounded by strep and MRSA and all these other things. So this testing problem has these huge downstream effects that aren't even, you know, aren't even about, you know, all of us healthy people figuring out whether we're sick or not. It's about the sick people getting better and then they can't leave the hospital. So uh, yeah, it's a quite a quite a situation. <laughs> there, there are five or fifteen minute tests now, though, right? But there, yes, there there are some, um, but they are not rolled out in a humongous way yet. So, you know, there we're seeing them in the thousands, but yeah. we need you know millions. millions. Yeah, well, I, I know several people who waited twelve days mm -hmm. to get their test results. Yeah, and the meanwhile they uh, could not work. Uh, so. 12 days is a long time. A very long time. Healthcare workers are sitting at home, you know, waiting, or they're going to work. And so, you know, that's that's a big problem. Um, they just did, the FDA just approved a serol serological test, uh, I think on the 2nd of April or the 1st of April. And so that should be the first chance that we have on a population basis to say, you know, Let's test 10,000 people in the New York area and see what the prev how many people have been exposed, and maybe we'll find out that 50% of the population has been exposed to coronavirus already, and then you know we you can make decisions about herd immunity for that area. So I think that is sort of the next step is for us to figure out you know how many of us have already had it. We don't really have any clue, and that ser serological testing um, should start rolling out. That was just approved in the U.S. the very first one. Uh, just a few days ago. But uh, that, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. What is serological testing? It looks for the antibodies. Um, so it, it detects antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so um, you can't, you know, if you, if you just get infected, it won't detect anything. Your body hasn't mounted a response that can be det detected yet, but it's like after seven days and then however long you keep those antibodies, we really don't know how long we're going to all be immune once we have had it, but nevertheless, probably some, you know, period of weeks or months, um, so that's what that is. So that'll they, be good. Have they uh, decided where that's going to be rolled out? I think they are starting it. The, the CDC is starting 
uh, but I don't remember where exactly. They are trying to do some prevalence testing, sero surveys, they call it. Um, but I don't, I, I forgot where. They're, they are, the CDC is developing their own one. Um, and they are also doing it, um, they're, they're deploying it in some communities to try to figure out this very question. So maybe trying to get ahead of things too. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here. This is this is fascinating. I wish we had another hour, but we we're we're running in at about almost three ten, and I would like to to be able to ask some uh, questions from the audience. So let me. Um, so it's it. So we. I can ask directly uh, some questions, but I I can also sort of aggregate some. Um, so. A number of questions are about what's happening elsewhere in other countries, and I will I will um, piggyback on that one because I'm I'm particularly interested in what what's going to happen in uh, in uh, in the developing world and also amongst our our uh, uh, more immediate trading partners. So, um, any insights about what's happening in the developing world and and as a as a second as a follow up to that question, what does it mean for globalization, for international trade, and 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 such issues? John, you can you can handle the the trade one at least. Um, yeah. So so I don't know a ton about what's happening in the developed world. Um, I have you know read articles where people are are very worried. Um, about South America and Africa, um, because as as unprepared as we were to deal with this, um, that may be another order order of magnitude of unpreparedness. Um, so, uh, given given that we do trade a fair amount with uh, with South America, that will have implications for trade going forward. Um, I, I, so, the, the the broader issue on trade, I think, is is when we come out of this and trade is going to be impeded for a, a, a good length of time and um, when we come out of this i think what we're going to see is that companies are going to dramatically diversify their supply chains right we are very very heavily dependent on china um, and that really matters uh, if you if you think about a boeing 787 they get their parts from about 50 different countries but they get each part from only one country and if you can't get any single part then you're just done and, uh, you know, we get the, the leading edge of the, of the tail fin and the rudder from China. If you can't get a leading edge of a tail fin and a rudder, you can't build an airplane, period, full stop. And um, so we're going to see a lot more diversification. We will see China's importance in our trade um, diminish significantly, right? So what, what uh, President Trump has been trying to accomplish for a couple of years, uh, I think the coronavirus is going to aid in that effort significantly. Well, certainly, I think uh, China's image in the world has been tarnished by this, and in part by Trump calling it the Chinese virus over and over again, uh, which irritated um, uh, lots of people that I know who go back and forth between China or had been going back and forth regularly between China and the U.S. doing deals, doing business, doing trade. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I do think uh, this whole image of China in the world um, is it's it's negative. Uh, this is uh, caused a negative impression of China, which probably already existed anyhow for a number of reasons. Uh, and um, now it uh, has certainly uh, escalated. I don't think and it's also just, uh, uh, one more thing on the supply chain, the supply chain uh, issue with, I mean, yeah, well, as you mentioned, like so many, uh, so many supplies have been coming from China. When with this U.S. and China tech cold war that's been going on uh, uh, since Trump took office, basically, uh, we've seen uh, definitely, um, you know, people, companies trying to diversify their supply chain or trying to, um, if they can. I mean, China has, you know, so much. Uh, uh, of an advantage in, in many uh, areas, uh, hardware and, and components and, and things that are necessary uh, for operations that it's hard sometimes to be automatically find a country that can replace it. But this search is going on and I think we'll see more diversification of supply chains uh, going forward. 
Good. Sorry, I'm 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 uh, uh, going through some some of the questions here. Um, there's a, a number of the questions are um, are about uh, the the particular effect on small businesses and and their sort of you know uh, so for example you can think of uh, right the the right the the contractors the smaller contractors uh, uh, the Uber driver. Uh, uh, these kinds of people. So a number of questions are about sort of sort of those uh, kinds of, of workers who you know find you know uh, health insurance a little bit more difficult to get anyway in the first in the in the. So how are they how are they faring and what what are we are we doing enough to help them? Well, the Uber the uh, unemployment insurance that was put on for that. Uh, in, includes the gig workers, including Uber drivers and others. So I, I think uh, the fact that they're eligible was a very important step because we have so many sole proprietors in the country. The small business question is, I think, a little bit more complicated. Uh, John alluded to this earlier. We, we're, we probably don't have enough in the loan category. There's all these rumors that I, I'm hearing from businesses here that the paychecks money is going to run out in no time and they're trying to be first in line and so on. So uh, I'm thinking that the small businesses, we might need a, a backup sort of a loan facility. Because again, going back to earlier comments from several people, having the infrastructure in place at the end, having the businesses there is going to uh, really change the outcome. You know, I was talking about a recovery in the fourth quarter. Even with the recovery in the fourth quarter, you're talking about maybe 7% unemployment in an optimistic scenario coming from, you know, 15 or 14 down to seven or something. I don't want to be alarmist, but I think you're, you're looking at numbers like that. Um, that would be, I think, a, a pretty positive outcome, actually, if it was down at six or 7% by the end of the year. But that's going to require, again, businesses there to hire people and being in place. Yeah, yeah so I, I think, Richard, we're already probably up around 13 or 14 percent. Right. I, rem I remember a couple of weeks ago hearing, yeah. yeah, I remember a couple of weeks ago hearing speculation that we might exceed 20. I thought, no, it's ridiculous, <laughs> um, but we may well get there. Um, one note on, on the unemployment insurance extension to self-employed and the gig workers, um, it has been at the federal level but the states, of course, administer unemployment insurance, and so actually qualifying for it. The states, California at least, uh, I read this morning, is, is sitting on its hand waiting for more gu guidance um, from the feds. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I, I'm oh, yeah. close. Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. No, no. no, I was just going to mention that um, I'm close to a, a downtown here in Silicon Valley, so on my daily walk, I'll often go through the ghost town of downtown. And, and see how various uh, shops are handling it. And so it was interesting to see uh, one of the restaurants that's closed now, not even takeout, uh, had a sign up. Like we were closed, we're closed for the time being. And uh, if you want to help out our employees, um, you know, our restaurant workers, here's the GoFundMe, GoFundMe. Right. And, you know, and I thought, yeah, that's a really original thing to do. It's not just government spending. You know, we, we're all in this together, I hope. And, uh, you know, I thought that, I thought that, that was very positive, actually. Yeah, that, that brings up a, a point that I, I end up making to a lot of people that I talk to. Um, we can talk about the cost-benefit analysis of, of, of flattening the curve, but as a part of that, um, the conversation is that the costs are about $1.3 trillion. Um, just back of the envelope calculation to the economy. And then people tell me, well, but we just passed $2.2 trillion in, in government spending. Isn't that a cost? Right? And it's important that people recognize that, no, it's not a cost. It's a transfer from one pocket to another. Right? It's going to come out of somebody's pocket in the future, and it's going into somebody's pocket today. So it, it, will, it will come with costs, but not the whole $2.2 trillion. No, I think, I think this, is, this is key to understanding, to understanding what's going on. Right? This is... That we have to think of this more as a as an insurance policy, right? We're helping each other out here. It's not a stimulus. It's really we're moving money from one end to another. That's right. And, and at some level, if we give too much money to small businesses now, <laughs> oh what? <laughs> it's better than giving too little money to small businesses, probably. Yes. 
Okay. Yes. Rich, what, Rich, what about, uh, because again, I'm, I'm going through the questions here. What about help for uh, local uh, and state governments? Uh, you know, in particular, I, I realize that, you know, a lot of, you know, school districts, right, the public schools are funded through, uh, through local and, and, and uh, state governments. So can you, can you tell us a bit about what's going on there? They are funded by in Colorado by um, state government, but they're largely funded by property ta taxes as well, right? So that's a split between the two. Okay. But the only thing that I've seen, I, I've certainly seen that we're anticipating significant, we're running budget scenarios that are dramatically uh, lower in terms of revenue. And I know other states are as well, because I communicate with center directors in other parts of the country. Um, there is a part of that credit facility I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, state and local governments can apply for those loans, very low, low, low interest loans. So there is a piece of the, the $2.2 trillion package that actually was aimed at state and local governments. But I think realistically, we're gonna be talking about significant um, you know, cutbacks in terms of state budgets and we are already seeing in some parts of the country, local governments are furloughing their employees. So um, we know that can't be too far down the line. And it actually was my introductory comment about business infrastructure and government infrastructure. You start laying off all of these workers and you don't have sort of uh, support, then, then how, how soon are you gonna get to a recovery? How long is it gonna take? Mm -hmm. And it might be John's unemployment number in that case. Um, I don't know about 20%. You scared me with that one. Yes, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little frightened of it myself. So, so, so this is, a, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be selfish here and ask a question about me. Uh, <laughs> I'm a professor at the University of Colorado. And uh, as a result, I'm, I, one thing I worry a lot about is that, uh, uh, you know, the university uh, gets a lot of their funding from you know, not so much from the state but and, and local participants, but also from international students that come mm -hmm. to Colorado uh, and and or and come and populate a lot of American universities, not just in Colorado. I must say that I'm I'm very, very worried about what this means for the budget of the university. So mm -hmm. Richard, do you have any insights on that one? Or John or well, we know that uh, international applications are drying up at the graduate level, um, master's level around the country. Um, people are assuming that they're going to have very small numbers of uh, international students. They don't know that they're going to be able to get into the country, you know, in terms of a, a, a visa of any sort, uh, the way things are going. And, you know, fortunately, we haven't built our programs at, at, at the university. We have not built these programs to be more or less internationally uh, exclusive. They're a, a mixture of students, but there are some schools in the country that have a huge percentage of international student enrollments in their graduate programs. So uh, there's gonna be some uh, suffering going on here. Yeah, I, I think there's gonna be a lot, um, both that you know, you would, you'd think that maybe it would be more heavily concentrated in public sector universities than private. Uh, you think the Dartmouths, the Harvards, the MITs, big endowments, mm -hmm. right? And, and what more appropriate use of an endowment than to sort of weather the storm and maintain your faculty? Um, yet I have, I have friends at, at Ivy League colleges who are you know, stars in their field who are genuinely worried at Ivy League schools. They're genuinely worried about being furloughed. Yeah, most of those endowments are earmarked. Every single penny is earmarked. <laughs> so it's not like you can just use it for general operations. Like those, those monies are meant for specific things and it's not easy to move them and just, my husband is a, works at a university and yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, and also another factor is the performance of these endowments, right? Their, their investment returns. So that's yeah. gonna be impacted as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, I think I think I'm going to, you know, continue asking questions here. Uh, I have a few ones on, on, uh, on what's happening for seniors, mm -hmm. seniors who are either at high school or 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 in college, who uh, are having a weird senior year. <laughs> but um, I I think that you know in general we underestimate what it means for 
for uh, a young adult uh, who has just finished college or just finished high school that needs to enter the labor market in a, in a particularly bad situation. And, uh, and then could you, so can you offer at least a, a vision of what, it, of what it might mean for these seniors and, uh, and if there's any hope? <laughs> the bad vision or the good vision? <laughs> the bad vision is they're going into a really incredibly difficult labor market. As we know, we're seeing companies not only uh, furloughing employees, but we're, we're seeing companies rescinding offers to people that they've already made offers to. So we're really seeing some uh, negativity in, in, in that particular regard. We know from the last serious recession that that group of graduates took a really long time to recover all the ground they lost with uh, lower dollar offers when they finally got jobs. So put them at a real disadvantage, a significant disadvantage in their sort of career path. And, you know, what do I want to say positively? I think it's uh, unbelievable the amount of things that are available for free and online that you can do. And I'm just sort of emphasizing to uh, my students, I'm saying, upgrade your skills, upgrade your skills, upgrade your skills. You don't want to look like you've been sitting on the bench for the last six months when, you've, when the thing finally clears. So you don't know R, learn R. You don't, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, you improve your communication skills, your writing skills, whatever it might be. I'll, I'll, I'll add you know, two, two small things to that. I mean, one is that you know, some, some government assistance directed at, at graduating seniors would not be a bad idea. Um, second, as we were just talking about, a lot of graduate schools are populated by foreign students. You know, it's too late to apply for next year, but my guess is that if you apply, you'll, you'll get in someplace. So think, think hard about graduate school. That would be my, my advice to a lot of, a lot of seniors. <laughs> Okay, let me uh, let me continue here down the down the list. I'm I'm not doing the best of job here. Um, so uh, they can always do a startup if you know they can always do a startup. <laughs> yes. Right. There are going to be a lot of people floating around with startup experience, right? <laughs> well, yeah. Eventually, yeah. But they, they have to think they have to think it through first. I mean, you can't just say, "Oh, I'm going to do this, and it's a dream, and I'll make a lot of money as a startup." But you, you got to really think it through, um, have have the rationale in place. Okay, so I've made I've made a decision here on my next my next bunch of questions. Although time is starting to to get short here, um, so uh, a lot of you have uh, have discussed the, the possibility that there will be more structural, more permanent changes. And uh, uh, some of our audience would, would, would like to know what it means. For example, uh, some ask questions about, will we go toward a more um, uh, public health care system? Others are asking about, um, clearly, the current crisis is, is, uh, is going to have impact on, on income inequalities, that's going to further widen the distribution of income. Um, what does that mean for future policies in, in that respect? So I know those are sort of two different teams, but um, I, I'm giving you guys two minutes to think about this. <laughs> I can talk on the healthcare. Yes. Things. Um, so I think that um, the question of whether we'll go toward a more uh, universal healthcare system, whether this will kind of kick us into that. I, I, I think you know, one of the things my team does is we're covering the election and, and we've sort of put that on hold because who, who knows, right, at this point. Um, but before COVID-19, our thinking on universal healthcare was that um, really there was no path forward, even if the Dems won the House, the presidency and not a supermajority in the Senate, which seemed very like a slim kind of thing, but they really needed to get, they'll need to get a supermajority in the Senate, Senate too, even to kind of contemplate something like that. So I think that that's, um, there's a very slim path for that. But that said, we are seeing right now probably an explosion in Medicaid with folks getting, uh, losing their jobs and getting on Medicaid. 
I think we will see an explosion in AC, subsidized ACA plans because people are losing their jobs and they're, if they don't qualify for Medicaid, they're gonna, they're, they sure probably qualify for a subsidy, a subsidized ACA plan. So I think we're gonna see sort of this default explosion in the in government subsidized health insurance that won't look like Medicare for all, but will be a bigger piece of the pie being paid for by the federal government. And I, I think that's where we'll we'll see this kind of thing end up. Um, that, that dovetails into the inequality question as well. Mm -hmm. um, right, so that's, that's a part of the safety, the social safety net. Um, I think, I'm, I'm hopeful that at the end of the day, we're gonna have a, a significantly enlarged social safety net, right? So it, when this happens again, we will be better positioned to deal with it. Um, and and if, if I may, I'm going to take 10 seconds. Rebecca uh, mentioned her books. I want to mention my organization, the National Economic Education Delegation. We're 600 PhD academic economists who are going out and giving talks on a wide variety of pol policy issues. We do that to seniors in high school, Rotary Kiwani, retirement communities. We're doing it online now, and we do it all for free. So if you're a member of a group where you want to have a cocktail party, give me a shout, and I'll set you up with a PhD economist. <laughs> Great. Well, we're almost out of time. I'm. I. I want to. I want to leave all of us to, with a little bit of, of hope. I think actually that in times of crisis, that's where most of human ingenuity starts, right? So I'm very, very hopeful that we're going to get a lot of really, really good medication, a lot of good research, a lot of good ideas from 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 this. I, I really want to to thank uh, our our speaker. Uh, Rebecca Fannin, John Heaven, Trina Suderos, and Richard Wobekine. I would like to, uh, uh, to thank the audience for, for joining us. Uh, I think I, I, I was very, very stimulating uh, conversation. I want to tell the audience that you will be asked to uh, complete a survey. And so please, uh, please do so. And um, I can test also to let you know that preparations are already underway for the next edition of the Congress on World Affair. And it relies on the generosity of audience member. And so please uh, go make a gift to the uh, 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 Conference on World Affairs. You can access the website through the uh, uh, CU uh, website. Thanks again to our panelists, and, and this, was, this was great. I, I've learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Thanks.